The topic tonight is the pandemic skills, the free trade dogma. It's, it's now 15 months since the COVID-19 pandemic hit Australia with huge health, economic, political and social impacts. We are not out of the woods yet by a long stretch, but it's already clear that the conventional economic wisdom of the last 40 years failed to cope with this pandemic. We've just seen the Morrison government dump its standard small government austerity policies in the budget. And tonight we, we have two speakers to look at how the free trade corporate globalisation part of neoliberalism has also failed and what's happening with that. Now we only got one of them here so I'll introduce Pat first. Um, so Dr Patricia Ranald is the convener of the Australian Fair Trade and Investment Network which last year celebrated 20 years of fighting the free trade dogma uh, by promoting fair trade <clears throat> based on human rights, labour rights and environmental sustainability. Pat is also an honorary associate at the Department of Political Economy at the University of Sydney. Our second speaker is Steve Murphy, and I promise he'll be here. He's the National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union. Um, I think I'll leave it to introduce him when he turns up. Uh, we're, we've, we're late starting and there is a closing time for the session because a noisy event starts on the other side of the pub at 7.15. So the speakers normally have 15 to 20 minutes to present and then there's a Q&A and then we have to finish before the noise overwhelms us. So um, I think I'll hand straight over to Pat and uh, please welcome her. Um, Thanks very much. If I stand here, can you see that? I'll just have to move this open. Can you? So the, the sort of free trade mantra comes from neoliberal trade policy, and I just thought I'd start off by reminding us what it says. It says you should not only have zero tariffs, that is taxes on imports, but zero other, all other barriers to trade and investment. And the agenda has really expanded about what a barrier to trade and investment is. Can you see? Okay. Oh, yeah. um, so what it's saying is that each country should specialise in its most cost competitive exports and import everything else at the lowest possible prices. We shouldn't have any active local industry policies and minimal government regulation. So what it does is maximise low-cost global um, production for corporations, um, but and it intensifies competitive pressures um, and promotes a race to the bottom, often on issues like labour rights and environmental standards. So when the pandemic hit, many economies were left over-dependent on imports and with a narrow manufacturing base, unable to produce the essential medical products that we needed and with scarce public health resources uh, to deal with the pandemic. Now, not, not all of this is down to um, neoliberal trade policy, but neoliberal trade policy certainly reinforced things like budget cuts and deregulation and contracting out of health services. Now, there are a lot of long-standing criticisms of this policy. Um, there's limitations. It's based on a 19th century comparative advantage theory and then there are limitations to that. Also, if we look at the history of industrialised countries like Australia and Britain and the US and also the countries that have developed since then, all of them have actually had active industry policies and some tariffs in order to industrialise before gradually reducing those tariffs. And um, if we impose those tariffs now on very low income developing countries, what we're effectively doing is kicking away the ladder to development. And there's been a lot of historical studies that show this. Um, uh, and another criticism is that uh, as these trade agreements have expanded and developed more and more aspects to them, they actually intrude into non-tariff areas of law and policy which are normally democratically decided, like um, things like medicine prices and um, um, special rights for corporations, which I'll talk about later. 
Um, we've got a very secretive and undemocratic trade process here. Um, they're negotiated in secret. It's a cabinet process. Um, we don't get to see the deal until after it's done and it is examined by a parliamentary committee but they can't change the agreement afterwards and Parliament only votes on the implementing legislation, not the whole agreement. So it's all designed to lock in future governments to something that's already been negotiated. Um, there is a current review of this model going on in Australia um, and there are other models, like the EU, for instance, does publish texts before they're signed and does have a much more democratic voting process. And even the World Trade Organization publishes texts. Um, so the pandemic has exposed flaws in five key areas that I'm going to talk about. And all of them expand corporate power at the expense of workers and communities. Um, so the first one is the restrictions on um, local industry policy. The second one is temporary worker arrangements, which have increasingly been um, entrenched in trade agreements. The third one is restricted regulation of essential services. And then the fourth one, and one that's been in the news a lot lately, is the actual entrenchment of monopoly um, uh, patent rights, particularly patent rights on vaccines and medicines for 20 years. Um, that's done through the WTO and other trade agreements, which is the opposite of free trade and competition. And also giving additional legal rights to corporations to sue governments um, if they change regulation. So the first one, and Steve's going to talk a lot more about this, so I'll just um, mention the issues. The pandemic has actually forced governments to act in ways which are contrary to um, the provisions in both WTO, World Trade Organisation, and regional and local trade agreements. Um, because these agreements say you mustn't have any policies which assist local industry, apart from in addition to tariffs, you can't have any other policies which assist or subsidise local industry compared with imports or um, international investment. But what actually happened here when the pandemic hit and in a lot of other places was that governments had to um, develop local industries. They had to uh, subsidise or assist them to develop, the, to make things like face masks, ventilators and vaccines. Um, and what's emerged from that is a general move towards the admission that we do need more local industry support um, for um, local development and for the economic recovery. Even the Morrison government has started saying those things and although the sorts of things they want to do, a lot of us wouldn't agree with it, with like a gas lead manufacturing recovery. Um, they are now taking a much more interventionist attitude towards local industry. And there have actually been bipartisan recommendations for more, um, for instance, using government procurement, government purchasing, to help develop local industry as well, which is a traditional local industry development mechanism. And the unions have developed um, a, a whole suite of more active local industry policies for um, green energy, um, government procurement and so on. And Steve's going to talk a lot more about that. Um, the second issue I wanted to talk about that's been exposed by the pandemic is um, temporary worker arrangements in trade agreements. Now, um, we have a permanent migration system. People can come to Australia as permanent migrants and that's what's created our vibrant multicultural society. And those workers, when they come to Australia, have the same rights as other workers. But temporary workers is, is an employment driven, uh, an employer driven scheme. You come to Australia sponsored by a particular employer and if you lose the job, you can be deported. And that means those workers are terribly vulnerable to employer exploitation. And there's been a gradual increase before the pandemic. There were over 800,000 of these workers of various kinds in Australia, various visa categories. And um, there's been numerous studies and, and media exposés of the exploitation of these workers. 
Uh, and of course, during the pandemic, they were um, excluded totally from income support. So the government, they were treated as disposable commodities. You come here when we want you, when there's no work, you go home. Um, and um, this was despite advocacy that they should have income support from unions and welfare groups. So the pandemic has further exposed the exploitation of these workers and how some industry policy models are dependent on these vulnerable workers like the horticultural industry and some sections of the um, uh, hospitality industry. Um, and as well as that, as well as the provisions to put temporary provisions for temporary workers in trade agreements, there are um, many trade agreements that have no commitments at all to human rights or labour rights. Or um, And so, for instance, we've just concluded the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with um, Australia, China, Japan, Korea, New Zealand and the 10 ASEAN countries, and that includes um, Myanmar, where they just had a military coup to China, where there's lots of violations of labour rights and reports of forced labour, and the Philippines, where um, worker activists and other activist unionists are being murdered. So um, the third issue I wanted to talk about was restrictions on regulation of essential services. Um, this isn't so well known, but um, all of the more recent trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the um, RCEP that I just mentioned, um, they all have extensive trade and services chapters which open trade and services rules, uh, sorry, trade and services to international investment and um, promote privatisation. They don't say you have to privatise, but if there is competitive tendering in, um, they encourage competition for provision of services. And if there is competitive tendering, then you have to have international as well as national competition. Um, and these rules now apply to services like aged care. So um, all services are included in, unless they're specifically exempted. And um, it treats the regulation of services like a tariff, so it's meant to be frozen at current levels and then gradually re reduced over time. So it doesn't take into account um, things like pandemics, let alone um, the climate crisis. Uh, and of course, what we've seen during the pandemic is that we require more regulation of things like health, um, aged care and other essential services to deal with the pandemic. Um, and if you look at the most recent agreements like the TBP and the RCP, it's interesting that they have a list of exclusions. They do say we exclude health, education, childcare, um, tra uh, public transport, but they don't include any, they don't exclude aged care. And um, because aged care has been fairly recently subjected to international investment, three of the largest providers in aged care are actually international companies now. Um, it means that those rules apply to aged care. So uh, this could restrict the kinds of changes that are being recommended by the Royal Commission, like increased staffing levels, um, increased regulation of service quality and so on. Um, and also the state regulation of carbon emissions hasn't been excluded from these um, trade and services chapters. The fourth one I wanted to look at was monopoly patent rights um, on vaccines and medicines. Um, in the World Trade Organization from 1995, there's been a 20-year monopoly on patents, which, give, which um, gives the control of um, medicines, but especially vaccines in the context of the pandemic. Um, it gives the production and price control of those vaccines to um, pharmaceutical companies, which are mostly very large global companies located in places like Europe and the US. Um, and that means that governments have to negotiate with these companies to get access to vaccines. And of course, the richest countries have been first in line to do those negotiations. So most of the capacity, the production capacity of those companies has actually been, about 80% of it has been reserved for countries like Europe, the UK, um, the US, Australia and so on. 
and um, the majority of countries, the majority of people in low-income countries will not have access to vaccines for at least until 2023 and maybe later. Um, there is a, an aid scheme for vaccines, which you know gives 60,000 vaccines to Papua New Guinea, <laughs> for instance, with a population of 10 million people. So the aid schemes for giving vaccines to poorer countries only um, vaccinate a very small percentage of the population, the emergency workers and so on. Um, so um, in response to this, India and South Africa and over 100 low-income countries in the World Trade Organization have moved to waive temporarily the patent rules in the WTO so that the intellectual property, the know-how to make these medicines can be shared globally and countries with the capacity to um, manufacture these can manufacture them at a much gr a greater scale and much more cheaply. So places like India and South Africa and Brazil do have manufacturing capacity and could do this if they could get access um, to the technology. Um, and there's been a lot of campaigning about this. You've probably seen it in the media. Um, and finally, the US actually has agreed to a form of waiver of the vaccine. But Australia, and, and it's been debated in Europe, Australia has not yet agreed to this. So there's still a campaign going on here, and there's a link to that campaign if you're interested in it. Um, the last thing I wanted to look at is corporate rights to sue governments. This is known as Investor State Dispute Settlement, or ISDS. It's a bit of a mouthful. But it's basically about giving... It's in a, an addition. All trade agreements have a normal dispute settling process, a government-to-government -government dispute process. Uh, but ISDS is an additional process which is only in some trade agreements, and it actually gives special rights to international corporations, which local corporations don't have, um, to um, sue governments or claim compensation for governments for often billions of dollars if they can claim that a change in law or policy has harmed their investment. And um, there's now over a thousand cases and the best one, known one here, is the Philip Morris Tobacco Company suing Australia over Australia's plain packaging um, law. Australia finally won it, but it took seven years. Yay! <laughs> um, and uh, cost a lot, it cost um, 24 million in legal costs, and Australia only got half of those back. So um, these there, there are all sorts of cases against health, environment, increasing numbers of cases against government action to reduce carbon emissions. There have also been cases against land rights policy, and against, there's, a, there's even one case against a rise in the minimum wage. So you can see that these are used as weapons by international corporations to discourage progressive laws and uh, changes in regulation by governments. Um, <clears throat> so um, what's happened during the pandemic and what has shocked a lot of people is that um, there's now signals from corporations and from law firms that advise corporations that they're going to take action against governments for things they did during the pandemic to save lives. There's already a case against Peru because Peru, uh, by a private toll company, because they reduced tolls um, to facilitate transport of essential goods around the country during the pandemic. And there's other threatened cases. And there's a whole industry of um, section of the legal profession which actually advises corporations about these cases that have been saying you can take these cases. Governments will try and defend them on the, on the basis that it's an emergency, but the framework of these um, of the legal system, uh, the tribunals that are set up, regards the um, whether or not there was um, harm or cost to the investment as more important than the reason for the regulation. So there's, a, again, a strong campaign to suspend those sorts of rights for private corporations to sue governments for pandemic-related cases, and also there's an ongoing campaign to keep them out of trade agreements altogether. <clears throat>
So um, I'll conclude by saying that I think that all of these flaws in the pandemic um, give us more arguments to, sorry, flaws exposed by the pandemic in these kinds of trade agreements give us the arguments to start um, strengthening a call for alternative trade policies that are not based on these sorts of principles. And those trade policies should be part of a broader um, progressive economic policy, um, which is socially just, environmentally sustainable, sustain environmentally sustainable and internationalist. That is, has regard to global um, effects and particularly effects on low-income countries. So it's rejecting both the neoliberal ultra-free trade mantra and also rejecting narrow nationalism like Trump and Hansen and so on. So what we need is a more diverse economy um, with manufacturing, agriculture, services um, and with high quality health, education and other essential services and the ability to regulate those services. Um, we need an open and democratic process, including all governments and the tax account of the specific needs of developing countries. Um, and trade agreements shouldn't prevent regulation of public health or environment or indigenous rights or workers' rights. Um, they shouldn't entrench medicine monopolies, which are the opposite of free trade and competition, nor give special legal rights to, um, like ISDS, to uh, global corporations. Um, and they should be based on enforceable labour rights and environmental standards, um, which is now beginning to be discussed in relation to trade agreements to prevent the race to the bottom that I talked about earlier. So um, I think that the pandemic gives us the weapons to continue a campaign for this longer term change. Thanks very much. I'll just say something about our, that's just the information about our network. We're a network of 60 organisations and also individuals. And um, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary and um, you can join or donate through our website. And we've got um, special anniversary tea towels which have these cartoons on them, which I thought I'd just show you. This is a cartoon about the Philip Morris case from Tambu. And this one is about the secrecy of trade agreements. And they're on sale for $10 if you want to get one out. Okay, please give a warm round of applause to Pat for that presentation. Uh, we don't have uh, Steve Murphy here from the AMWU. He's tried to ring. Okay. He's tried to ring, but I would have had to stop the filming to uh, okay. okay. So what we'll do is um, just go straight to the question and answer. Um, we've got uh, plenty of time compared to what the normal situation is. Um, we can finish early if we run out of questions, but we'll just take them until we we conclude uh, the, the level of discussion among us. Uh, we've only got the one microphone, so um, if anyone's got a question, just say your name first, so um, that will be the one answering it. So any... Yeah. No, that's right, I can... You can hear? Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andy Mack. Um, <coughs> good on you, Pat. Yes, it. it's, it's, uh, it's terrific to see this campaign in 20 years. Congratulations, that's fantastic. Um, I've, I've always been amazed by the way in which multinational, multilateral and bilateral agreements seem to be able to stick when it comes to corporate prerogatives and rights, whereas in terms of international uh, justice and um, child slavery or international criminal court, all that, and it seems to be countries will take or leave the requirements. I just want to get down to the question of the legal process by which an international agreement can impose on the sovereign citizens of the country something which is against our interest. How can they get away with it? Interesting. 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 
Yes, well, you're right. These agreements, uh, because they're um, about trade and certainly the, if you look at who's in the room and who's lobbying who in these agreements, it's definitely international capital that's there. And these trade agreements are legally enforceable. So when governments sign up to them, um, they, um, if they break the rules, there's a process by which trade sanctions can eventually be enacted. In other words, you can have your, your goods, or usually it's goods, banned or taxed by the other government. If one government makes a complaint to a tribunal if it's found than the other government. So it's much more enforceable than all the human rights and other agreements which are um, supposed to be legally binding but only enforced by naming and shaming. So, for instance, the UN Human Rights Council, if you violate those provisions for labour rights, for example, as Australia has done since the Howard government work choices, for example, you just get named and shamed in the Human Rights Council. There's no actual penalty. Um, and that's why um, a lot of uh, people from labour and environment movements have argued that we should have enforceable commitments in trade agreements to labour and environment standards, for example, and human rights standards for that matter. And there are some agreements which move, have moved in this direction. The EU has moved in this, this direction which is with its agreements, for example. But basically it is true that capital makes sure that its agreements are legally binding. Whereas um, with human rights and so on, um, the, which is a, a, the UN is a much broader forum. It actually has more countries in it than the WTO, but um, they haven't been able to get that same sort of um, legal enforceability. That's a comment on the, the whole structure of the global economy. Oh, thanks very much, Pat. That was really interesting. I wonder if your your the points of your talk are available anywhere on the aftermath or something like that, because that's really worthwhile getting that out, that information out on, to a broader audience, I think. Um, my particular bugbear is the question of the massive profits that the that the um, pharmaceutical companies are making out of this pandemic and how that interacts with the issues that you've raised there. And my particular bugbear is we sold off Commonwealth Serum Laboratories in 1993, was it, or four, under a Labor government, I should point out. And what have we lost out of that? We now have CSL as a, as a multinational corporation itself, which is doing deals all over the place. But it has even been raised by the Morrison government in its new mantra of spending money. I don't know what happened to the debt truck. It must have sprung out. It must have got a puncture somewhere. Um, so if we had had CSL as it was, and it was a very, very viable organisation into the CSRO, and it developed a whole lot of vaccines and other activities during its pretty much 50 year existence, I think, 40 years anyway. So, I mean, I think that we have to raise the question, if the Morrison government is talking about, um, you know, investing in the manufacturing of vaccines, why, I think, as a movement, we have to start launching a huge campaign that this be a public, that be a government-owned um, institution that is going to act under the, under the, as a publicly interested organisation which will be under the control, supposedly, of the people and will act in the future in the interest of people rather than as a multinational corporation making huge profits out of this pandemic as all the others are doing. Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and so on, are making massive profits out of this. Thanks, if you could comment. Thanks. Well, th this um, talk is based on an article I have published in the Journal of Political Economy, which was the special issue that Frank's been plugging at these 
on the pandemic and came out in June last year, and it is available online. So that's the Journal of Australian Political Economy, and all the articles in it are in, uh, published, uh, available online. Um, and there is material on our website which deals with a lot of these issues. Um, but I'm happy to give you a copy of the slides if you want them. Um, the, um, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's a scandal that the um, global pharmaceutical uh, industry has already made multi-billion dollar profits from what they've already sold to the richer countries. And now they're saying, no, no, we can't give up our intellectual property because that would undermine the whole intellectual property system. <laughs> Um, but they're just not, you know, they are, they're only prepared to negotiate uh, government by government. They're not prepared to really allow the vaccines to be rolled out, you know, in the, in the scale and at the price that they're needed to actually vaccinate the whole world. Um, and with CSL, yes, I agree. I think we should be campaigning to say that if the, that if the government subsidises CSL, it should take out equity in CSL. And there should be a much more rigorous um, uh, regulation, regulatory framework in Australia to make sure that in the future um, we do have the capacity to um, produce vaccines and that the intellectual property is public property, they are public goods. So um, I agree that we should be um, raising those issues. Mm. Yeah, well, it already, a lot of it is already public anyway. In fact, all, Pfizer and AstraZeneca were both developed with public money. That looks some good questions. Thank you, Patricia, for your discussion. Um, it strikes me that the elephant in the room is, is the question of free trade and protection, protectionism tariffs. Um, I have a view about that, and I think we, we, we need to protect our jobs more and more so today. Uh, I'm seeing out there, there aren't too many career jobs. I understand there are plenty of jobs, but not too many career jobs. I'm sorry that our second speaker hasn't arrived, because perhaps this point might be made to him in terms of the manufacturing sector, but we don't seem to be engaging in that discussion, that debate about protectionism. It's all taken for granted. We're happy to buy cheap TVs and cheap cars and dishwashers and what have you. The truth is, we're not manufacturing much. Any views on that? Yes, well, I think that as um, I said at the beginning, the truth is that most industrialised countries like Australia have developed their infant industries, as they're called, through having tariffs and other measures, other government measures, to develop those industries. And then when those industries have developed, they gradually reduce tariffs. But in a lot of other countries, they don't give up the whole um, gamut of other supports for industry. If you look at an industrial powerhouse like, well, all, the, all of the Asian tigers, South Korea, um, or uh, Japan, or um, Germany, and France, they all have um, clear industry development policies which are supported by government, not necessarily through tariffs. I don't think tariffs are the um, weapon that can be used by industrialised countries so much now, but other forms of well, industry they development. Subsidize. Pardon? They yeah. subsidise. Yes, the yes, subsidize they subsidise research, they have other supports. And um, the U US does it too, actually. So um, Australia has been sort of uh, right out there saying, you know, we're pure, we don't have, you know, we're pure free traders, we don't have any subsidies, we have the lowest tariffs in the world, etc. Um, so I agree with you that we ne that needs to change. And it's PC is not here because he's been involved in local industry development plans in places like the Hunter Valley and other places which bring together the idea of local industry with um, plans for green energy and alternative um, pathways to new industries through um, uh, producing carbon emissions, but also other forms of um, environmentally 
sound industries as well. So in the Hunter Valley, they've got a, a very broad coalition of unions and community groups, which are actually developing with the university, with local government, you know, specific plans for we could have, you know, wind farms here, we could have solar arrays here, we could have other forms of um, ecotourism or other forms of industry, which can replace those um, industries which are going to disappear um, as we move to lower carbon emissions. Um, but also uh, preserving and developing more traditional forms of industry. For instance, um, in the Hunter Valley there, or in, around that region, there's still companies that make trains. There's still companies that, you know, sophisticated, have sophisticated engineering capacity. And um, of course, we saw during the pandemic, it's possible to produce ventilators in Australia. It's possible to produce all sorts of medical products in Australia. Um, and we ought to have that capacity um, for the next pandemic. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's a whole lot of, um, I agree, there's a whole lot of active things that government can do, but they, communities can also be involved in that, and local government and universities. Thank you, it's another question. Yeah, g'day Brian. Yeah, um, with the uh, TPP, you were saying um, the government beat Philip Morrison. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit more. Any facts you could tell us what finally got them on over the line? Seven years, <laughs> a bit to tell there. And I'm wondering, um, did you see Four Corners yesterday? Uh, the story about the textile industry and um, Wages have been um, paid half the um, basic wage. No, we'll leave that one. That was in Australia. Yeah, last okay. night. Yeah, no, I, I missed it last night. Oh, okay, no, yeah. right on the um, subject. Yeah, yeah. Um, workers in Britain and elsewhere getting robbed blind and yeah. nothing being done about it. Yeah. Um, and the last question um, Do you think the lockdowns were um, justified considering that? Um, COVID has been found to be a uh, little m less than more than um, a bad flu. Like, um, it's been faulty PCR testing, everything blamed on, um, all deaths blamed on COVID. Like, Sweden and um, a couple of Texas and Florida and America have proven that no masks, no lockdowns. They're, they're way down the scale for the rate of deaths and uh, injury, like, whereas New York and um, California that had strict uh, men up there at the top. It's, so uh, do you think the lockdowns were actually justified? Like, do you think it was a flu turned into a plague? It turned into a plague. A plague turned into a flu. Yeah. 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 I'd say so. Okay, well on the Philip Morris case, a few people have heard this story, but um, what happened with Philip Morris was that um, we had a big fight over the US Australia. The Philip Morris Company is a US company. And when the US Australia Free Trade Agreement was negotiated in the 90s, we had a huge fight to keep this right of corporations to sue governments out of that agreement, and we succeeded. Um, so when Australia enacted the plain packaging law, Philip Morris couldn't sue under the US Australia Free Trade Agreement, and the TPP wasn't in place yet then. So what it did was it shopped around and found an, a, an investment agreement between Australia and Hong Kong, which had that provision in it, had this um, ability for corporations to sue governments, uh, shifted some assets to Hong Kong, said, we're now a Hong Kong company, we're going to sue you under this agreement. Um, now, um, and it went to a tribunal. The tribunals are made up of investment lawyers who mostly represent corporations and the rules are very stacked towards corporations, but even that tribunal, um, it took five years, but it did find that Philip Morris wasn't actually a Hong Kong company, and so they couldn't use that agreement. So it was a ju they, they lost it on jurisdiction, but the actual substantive issue was never debated, but it took five years for them to decide that and cost $24 million in legal costs for the Australian government. Um, so this is the kind of thing that often goes on in these tribunals. Companies will shop around until they find an agreement that suits them and then they'll, you know, try and um, 
use that agreement if they can shift some assets there. Um, the, um, what's the next issue? Oh yes, the, te the global textile industry is an incredible scandal and an illustration of that race to the bottom I talked about. Um, textiles um, were mostly um, taken out of factory production in Australia uh, from the 1980s onward as we reduced tariffs, but they went into um, uh, home worker production in Australia. So there are lots of, well, there's, there's not a lot of textile production in Australia, for clothing and footwear production in Australia, there's some textiles. Um, and um, those workers are very poorly paid, but there is now some regulation of homework in Australia. But if you look at what's happened globally, um, the, a lot of textile production in Australia went first to China, then China had a rise in the minimum wage from about 2007, so they shifted to Bangladesh, they shifted to Cambodia, and to lower and low wage destinations. And without some global flaw on that process, um, then you just get um, increased exploitation of those workers. Um, so I guess that's what the Four Corners program was about, yeah. Um, so it is really a textbook study of that process where we get very cheap garments available in rich countries. Um, you do get some employment in um, the poorest countries, but um, it's under very harsh conditions for the workers. Low, not just low wages, but starvation wages and you know, shocking health and safety, long hours. People are mostly young women who work for five or ten years and their health is ruined and there's no um, workers' compensation or anything like that. So it, it really is a, a story which illustrates all these points we've been talking about. Um, I um, don't agree with you about the pandemic. I think that it was right for governments to say that health should be the main priority. I do think the pandemic is real. A lot of people have died from it, and I agree with the strategy of putting public health first. And we did have to have some lockdowns to do that. That's just my view. Any other questions or comments? Just one other thing. I've got a question regarding EPPs. One of the things I've signed to find out about is a lot of these TPPs tend to be under high secrecy or away from the public domain. Is there any protocol or any standard or any means of forcing this information once, especially after it's been signed, it becomes uh, publicly available for all, uh, not just the parties like the companies or the lawyers, but also for the public to be able to see if things aren't right, if we, if we, if we can't change this current TPP, can we actually change future TPPs and put better restrictions pro um, citizens rather than pro businesses, governments, or vested interests on the on the top end of the echelon? Can you? So, is your information on that, or can you um, enlighten us on that, please? Well, the texts do become public after they're signed, so we do know what's in the TPP now, but we didn't know what was in it um, before it was signed. And that's the problem because um, actually because the TPP was negotiated over about seven years, there were some leaked documents, but they were only leaked at certain points in the negotiation, so we didn't get to see the whole result or text before until after it was signed. And then once it's signed, it's very difficult to change. So that's why we've been campaigning for to have a trade process which is much more open and democratic that the, the negotiating text should be published during the negotiations, that there should be full involvement, not just of business, but community organisations um, in uh, examining the text and putting in their views about it. And also that the whole text should be published at the end before it's signed, that it should be independently evaluated. In Australia, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which does the negotiations, they do a, what they call a national interest assessment, but it's them marking their own homework, you know. They always say it's a good agreement. <laughs> I've been looking at the agreements for 20 years and they never ever said it's a bad agreement. Um, so um, 
and also Parliament should vote on the whole agreement, not just the implementing legislation. So it should be able to vote on whether to have provisions like, um, you know, corporations' rights to sue governments or stronger medicine monopolies. So that, that's part of our campaign. And as I said, there is currently a review by the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties of this whole process, and there were lots of submissions saying all the things I've just said, it should be more open and democratic. I don't think we're going to get it under this government, but if there's a change of government, I think we will get a more open process because um, all of the opposition parties have policies that support that. Okay. Any more? Do I get another? Can I get another go? Yes. Sorry, Peter. No, no, that's this one. Um, with the Trump uh, regime, uh, he didn't have any problem saying the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and other agreements are crap. You know, day one. So obviously, the question of the capacity of the state to do that yeah. does come into the equation. But that raises the question now of the controversy about the role of the World Trade Organization, given that it seemed to me that the World Trade Organization was partially novel because the, the Yanks didn't support it. Is that the case and what's its status now? Yes. Um, from Afdinet's point of view, we think there should be trade agreements which involve everyone, like multilateral kind of, um, and we support something like the WTO where, where those sorts of agreements can be negotiated. But the WTO is corporate controlled at the moment and that's our criticism of it. Like Corporations have much more influence on it than anyone else. Um, but Trump wasn't against trade agreements. He just wanted to have what are called bilateral trade agreements between the US and one other country. Um, sorry, did you want to get past that? Um, so, um, what he wanted, because the US is the largest economy in the world, he wanted to have a series of bilateral agreements between the US and other countries and pick them off one by one. So that's why he went, he, he withdrew from the TPP and wanted to have individual agreements with those countries. And with China, he was perfectly willing to have um, an agreement with China, provided it was on his terms. Um, so um, that's where our approach is different from Trump. We are internationalists. We, we think you could have a better global trading system that was based on certain rules and principles, whereas he is a narrow nationalist who just wants to have trade agreements that suit the US. And he, doesn't but he, he was actually representing, allegedly, the workers in terms of the well, strong. if you look at the debate that happened about the TPP in the US, the strongest movement against it was from unions and, and progressive organisations. And before the US elections, Hillary Clinton had to come out against the TPP as well. As both she and Trump said they would um, not go ahead with it because there was a very strong progressive movement against it because it had all these corporate rights in it. Um, for instance, on the medicines, the public health movement and unions in the US didn't want more medicine monopolies which were in the TPP because they knew that would mean that they could never get rid of their rotten um, medical system where everybody has to pay a fortune for medicines if it was cemented in a trade agreement. So, um, you know, there was a progressive movement against it, but what Trump did was mobilise nationalism and um, xenophobia um, as he has for his policies generally, I mean, closing the borders to, to immigrants and so on. So that is that is a different perspective from what I'm talking about. With the WTO, um, what Trump did was refuse to appoint or, or to approve appointments to the WTO's uh, disputes settlement mechanism to the appeals body. And so that paralysed the disputes process in the WTO. Um, and he did that because he felt that, again, the, from a very narrow US perspective, that they hadn't been um, winning enough disputes in the WTO dispute system. So um, Biden has, uh, has not actually um, reversed that yet, but um, the 
US, t uh, US Trade Representative Catherine Tai has had a much more open sort of attitude about uh, the WTO and said that the, the US doesn't want to participate in the WTO. But they haven't yet reversed that policy, so I think they're still going to use that as a bit of bargaining chip to see whether they can get a better um, process, you know, a better, what they see as a better deal for the US and the WTO. Um, the US and the EU and Japan and the more powerful economies already dominate the WTO as it is, but they want even more say for the US. Thanks very much. I think we've probably come to the end of that part. I'd like you all to uh, show your appreciation to Pat for the really fine uh, discussion we've just had.